Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Ozone Podcast, Mindset Wealth for Young Leaders. This is a podcast where we help um, young leaders or people, you know, looking to get into careers or develop themselves as young people, um, learn new skills and habits and traits from those that have already conquered feats in their own careers um and i just want to say thank you to all of you because we managed to get number two in a worldwide podcast chart this week we've had one episode out i managed to get up there uh, i'm so humbled by that i'm so excited that you guys even like the content i've got nothing but great feedback um and i'm even more excited about our guest today um today we have mr khaled al Amari with us um and um, i only actually discovered khaled's content this week while i've been in the UAE. We are shooting from Dubai today. Um, Khalid um, actually came up because I was asking, you know, uh, my followers online who we should actually get on the podcast. And, you know, everyone was messaging me, Khalid, 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 Khalid. I was like, okay, this guy. So I DM'd him, I emailed him, and I got everyone to bombard his Instagram as well. And he got back in touch with me. He emailed me and he said he'd love to accept the invitation and come on the podcast. And within 48 hours, made this happen. So he's an absolutely incredible guy with an incredible mindset. Um, he's an MBA, Stanford graduate. Um, he's done journalism with the CNN, for the CNN out here in the Middle East. Uh, and right now is a Facebook uh, creative partner as well, um, working on launching their new product, uh, Facebook Watch here out in the UAE. So he does some incredible things. He shares a lot about you know his journey, um, you know how he you know initially studied um, something completely different that didn't even relate to what he's doing now. Uh, he has a has a beautiful wife and three children, and he's actually you know his career is based around his own freedom now. He's a, he freelances now and spends a lot of his time you know trying to be the best husband, father um, he can, and just striving to get as much happiness as possible. So we'll have a we'll, we'll, we had a beautiful interview with him, and uh, we'll be touching on that shortly. Um, are just a couple of um, quick sponsors that have helped us make this all possible today. First of all, Flavor. That's my company, Flavor. Um, you know, we, we, we are lucky that we can even like, shoot this content with the, with the team and everyone out here helps me out. Um, and, you know, the website is www.flavor.co. You know, we help brands create content online for their social media. We help strategize their online brand. We create digital content and also uh, put it together um, and just get across their audience and help them you know, manage their communities too. So it's kind of an all-around digital marketing um, uh, network uh, for brands. Also, uh, we're lucky that we're joined, uh, actually have the pleasure of shooting this today in uh, Creative Lab Middle East. Uh, they allowed us to use this, this creative space and create this content here, which is very, very beautiful of them and very kind. Um, you can check them out at Creative Lab ME on Instagram. If you go on there, they're actually running a competition right now. It's called Creatives for Good, but they're actually allowing people to post content and create content uh, that has meaning and they're offering a, a huge cash prize um, for, for um, people, creators that do that. So please do check that out. Give them a, uh, give them a, a little warm welcome. Uh, um, to the Ozone community. Um, and if you want to check Khalid uh, out on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, um, he's Khalid Al Ameri everywhere. And it's um, how you spell that is K H A L I D A L A M E R I. So if you go check him out, say hello, tell him how great he was on a podcast because I thought he was fantastic. Um, so, yeah, this is the Ozone episode two. Um, and this is with Khalid Al Ameri. Enjoy, guys. Mr. Khalid. Salam. Wa alaikum assalam. We're here. Bro, Welcome. this is such a pleasure, man. Welcome. I'm Welcome so everybody. excited about this. Thank you, we're man. We're excited Thank to you. have you. It's an honor to be for you. The amount of people that were literally telling me to do this. Like, yeah. when, as soon as I came here, I, had, like, I was telling the guys on Instagram as well, I was telling you, I had no intention of no podcast. I didn't even bring the equipment. My brother bought it. And then as he was leaving, I thought, you know what? Let me just take it off him. And I went on Instagram. I was like, guys, who should I get? And your name was just like... I was like, who is this guy? Like, <laughs> <laughs> who is this guy? I felt so bad. I've never heard of him. I went to Instagram and they were like, no, you need to speak to him. Like, you guys are just alike and everything. And then I literally went on your profile. No joke. I just saw like your smile on like every video. <laughs> I was like, yeah, this guy seems like a good guy. <laughs> yeah, alhamdulillah. I remember, um, 
the first thing is, is I had, uh, is that okay? Yeah, perfect. So the first thing was uh, on one of my pictures, I think it was with my, a picture, my last Instagram post, people started tagging you on the bottom. Right, Say, right, hey, right, check yeah, Omar's yeah. Instagram. Yeah. He wants to get you on his podcast. I told them to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they, they literally lit it up. Yeah, and if, uh, if I responded, and again, I saw, your, saw, saw you and uh, sort of... Um, the profile that you had and it's one of peace positivity right uh saw that you were in dubai busy guy doing meetings as well Ooh. working hard mashallah so i was like man let's do this man let's welcome you to abu dhabi bring thank you bro. down here and uh, get some work in thank you man i mean uh, you know what all i want to do really is i just want to so this entire podcast is kind of literally the title of it is mindset wealth for young leaders um and the idea is that you know we we you know, we all come from like a generation now where you have access to so much information. There's yeah. so much going on out there, a lot of noise. Now, on one side, you have people that see it from a, a, a point of view of, okay, this is too much, it's all poison. You have other people that see it from a point of view of, you know what, there's actually some good in this. Yeah. I like to come from the optimistic point of view. Of course. Um, and what I'm curious to learn and by speaking to people like you, Marshall, the stuff you've achieved is incredible. And I mean, I'm so excited to learn more because I feel Thank like you. I'm just getting to know you for the first time. This is all about developing the right mindset, you know? Like, you know, what makes someone be of the type of, you know, develop the right characteristics, the right morals, you know, the right small cadences in your personality that can make a big difference in your life. Of course. So, you know, why don't we take it back maybe to, you know, you know, let's take it way back because I actually don't even know where you're from. Sure. So, so tell me about your childhood, you know, where are you from? Yeah. Where do you originate from? Where does accent come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Le um, for sure. So I was born in Abu Dhabi. Uh, my father is a Marathi. And my mother's British. Right. So okay. my mother uh, comes from Scotland. Uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, wow. uh, petite uh, lady. Um, and uh, she, she, they actually met in college. So my mom and dad met when my dad went there to study okay. uh, in the kind of mid to late 70s. And then she moved back with my dad in 1982 right. uh, when he finished his studies. And uh, at that time... You know, this was sand, yeah. Yeah, 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 sand, yeah, some yeah. roads, some short buildings. So, you know, brave woman, strong woman to come come here at those times, you know. Um, and uh, they had me uh, in 83 and then my two other brothers in 85 and 87. Wow. Um, we went to private school. So we were in a British school for most of our elementary. Uh, then we went to an American school for our high school. Um, I studied in the UK. Uh, oh, so I was in, yeah, I was in South Shields. Do you know South Shields? South Shields. It's like no. just out, of, just off of Newcastle. Is that a new? Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, a, okay, cool. Now you know what it is. I have some family up north. Well, my wife has family up north. Yeah, that's the only time I've been there. But I haven't been in Newcastle before. It's funny yeah. enough. Well, yeah. Newcastle's great. So I was in South Shields, which is it's a bit bit rough. You know, no, no, I have heard of it. Now you say, it, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I have heard of it because I, yeah, yeah, no, I know where South Shields. Is. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's yeah. a tough place. Yeah, yeah. Any, but oh, like, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But lots of memories there. Uh, I was in nautical college, so right. I, I was uh, a maritime officer, commercial. Um, so I would spend like six months in South Shield studying and like six months at sea right. on board ships. Wow. And then, yeah, that was, uh, that was a tough point. time. So hold, on, hold on, hold on. So you'd go, to, so what were you studying at the college? Nautical science. Oh, what is that? So that's basically how to navigate a ship. Like those big ships. Well, what that you made you want to do? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, man. So, you know, and here's when you talk about the content and the, the messages that you're trying to give out. You know, in, in 19... Uh, oh, sorry, no, good, thank God it wasn't 19. In 2001, right. when I graduated high school, what social media platforms were there? Uh, maybe people started Friendstar or something. Something like that. But Friends there, Reunited. There, there was nothing, yeah, there was nothing, no sort yeah. of messages that we could Correct. see. There was nothing. TV and nothing. whatever yeah, 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 whatever they would give us, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And there was no search engines, like like strong search engines for us to search for right, content. Right, right, right. So for us, I mean, we, we, we made these decisions somewhat blind. And, and, mm. and in, these, in, in, in our part of the world, the concept of a guidance counselor wasn't, wasn't there. Right. So we just thought, okay, where can we get a scholarship from? Where are my friends going? Because we'll go with them. And uh, it was basically, we had an opportunity for a scholarship. They were going to send us to the UK, pay for our studies, give us some pocket money. Right. Sure. Wow. Like there we didn't, at those times we didn't think, okay, what do I want to be in the future? Yeah. What are the possibilities? Because then back in those days, yeah, and your opportunities were limited. Right, right, and right, right, uh, right, right. You know, in our cultures, it's like engineer, you know, <laughs> uh, accountant, doctor. Uh, and th those are sort of the, the definitions of success where now uh, this whole new world's opened mm -hmm. up. D multiple worlds have opened up where we see successes and things that might have been stupid before. Correct. So, so basically, I went, I just, 
it landed on my lap. My, I wanted to sort of get my parents off my case, moving to the UK. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was, it worked out for me. You know, but like I didn't want to be doing that. Wow. So uh, how old were you at the time? Must be twenty. Seventeen. Seventeen. Oh, yeah, when oh, I first graduated you're, high school. Oh, so you're saying college, like English college. Like, yeah, English okay, college. Okay, yeah, okay, graduated cool. high school. Right, 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 right. And went to English college. So when I was seventeen. And then, and then so you're seventeen, and you're sp- spending six months on a ship as well. Yeah. So so the lo- so we'd spend six months, but it would be broken up. So I might right. do four months at a time. The longest I ever spent at once on a ship without touching land was about four months and a week. Wow. Without touching land. How much fish did you eat? Oh my god, <laughs> man! It was, uh, yeah, man. It taught me a lot of patience. Really? Alhamdulillah, and uh, and so, ne- so never. Again. So let's actually just stop there. Let's dive into that. Let's let's talk about the strength, resilience, the patience. You know, uh, what do you think you learned on l- just that ship or at that time that you apply to your life now? Okay, so definitely patience. Right. I mean, that, that's like, you can't be, I mean, it's a floating, I mean, okay, we're working there, we're free, but it's a floating ship. You're mm. in the middle of, it's a, sorry, it's a floating jail. Yeah. Like you're in the middle wow. of the Pacific. Where are you running? Where are you hiding? Where are we, you know, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. there. Like if you want to leave tomorrow, you can't, you're stuck. Wow. Until you get to the next port. Um, Tolerance, I think, was a big one. Like, uh, how many people were there with you? Around 50, 60. And, and not everyone would get along with everyone, I suppose. No, of well. course not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, so, so now you're dealing with a... It's almost like having a condensed like uh, world. You know what I mean? Like, Imagine it's, there was literally like 50 people in the world and they all lived on that yeah. ship. Like, yeah, like yeah, that. No, no, yeah, that's a great, yeah. great, great way of putting it. Um, and, and, you know, there was Filipinos, mm. there was British, there was Eastern Europeans, there was Australians. Mm. And... You know, when people get bored, man, they start talking and philo- everyone becomes a philosopher at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, they think they know everything. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, and, and, and they want to have debates about stuff and then you have to look at them the next day, you know. So so I think tolerance of other people's opinions, uh, tolerance of other people's beliefs, um, you know, at a young age to learn that was was really special because, you know, now as, as an adult, you know, like I think tolerance is one of my, my key strengths. You mm-hmm. know, like I really... I'm able to deal with all types of people. I'm able to deal with hate. Mm. I mean, and you were talking about that, you know, yeah. like yesterday on your Insta story, like how you get hate, but you're able to just sort of push it to the side and right. focus on what's positive and what's important. Right. That's almost uh, one of the, the, the challenges that, you know, it just comes with this world that we're in, you know? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's so scary. imagine having that in your face. Leave yes. Instagram. Yes. Leave, not, not on a phone where you can just put, imagine like right there. Shiptogram. Shiptogram. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But like, so, so tolerance, I think patience and tolerance were right. the two... Uh, what are the two big things? Obviously, you know, stuff like teamwork, building mm-hmm. in teams more on the professional side. But in terms of who I am as a human being right now, tolerance and, and patience. And another thing, um, and this should have really been first, gratitude, man. Really? Like, gratitude. Like, to think that I could have had a career mm. where I would be away from my family, away from civil- civilization mm. for four months at a time. Like now I get to work in a place where I can see my family every day and do work wow. I love every day. So I know what the other side looks like. Right. You know, I know what it's like to to have to do something you don't want to do to provide for your family. Right. And to be able to now be at a position in my life where I'm able to work hard and do the things that I love to do for a living. Yeah. I am so grateful. I literally have to like in the middle of a job that I'm doing, whether it's for social media, whether it's presenting on TV or something like that. Literally, when we're taking a, a break. I straight, I, I'll go to the side and say a prayer and slap myself and go, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. And, and for me, it's, it's being able to see that experience and know what the other side looks like. Because you have a lot of these kids now that are getting famous, whether it's on social media mm-hmm. or traditional media. And, you know, I think, you know, sometimes they get fame really quick. Correct. You know, they, 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 they sort of, they lack that sort of professionalism. Right. Um, they, they lack maybe a bit of work ethic yep. because they're just naturally gifted. So so one of the things that uh, it's, a, it's a very kind of hot conversation right now and, and there's actually something I'm working on uh, in terms of a business model and product to try and tackle this is that is the fact that imagine, it, put it this way, imagine um, being the CEO of CNN and you have no qualification in journalism. Yeah. You know what I mean? At all. Or in business or in broadcasting. That's literally what having a following on social media is like. Yes. You have people who get millions of followers, <laughs> yes. hundreds of thousands of people. I think because the thing is, if you have hundreds of thousands of followers, you're not. It's not hundred thousand people you're you're broadcasting to. It's millions because of the reach it has. Yeah. So 
the the pressure of that is insane because not only do you have you know compliance now now there's so much advertising compliance now you can't be expected to know all that because there's no form of education for it it's almost like the curriculum hasn't understood that this is a real thing right now my, my sister is 17 year, years old going to you know college in the uk her friends want to be you know beauty youtubers yeah you know and it's crazy and it's it, uh, my wife right now is, a, is like a beauty blogger and she does her thing and it comes with great pressures because she's never had a business education you know so she's when she first used to send emails would be like oh my what do i say like how do i apply to this person how yeah. do i negotiate and now she's learned but a lot of people don't even have that basic and it it can be a problem you know and a lot of people are missing those core life skills to get them to that next stage absolutely and and i think i think another thing is once they get there mm. i think i think uh, See, for me is these things can come. Right. You know, these things can be taught, mm -hmm. like how to be more professional, take responsibility, understand your audience, you know, think about your messaging. Just like, for example, maybe your wife can say, okay, before I send out this, this thing, which might be controversial, let me, let me run it past by Umar. Let me run it past by a few people, mm. you know. But I think the things that, that need to be inherent are the stuff that I was talking about, like gratitude, Correct. work ethic, these Correct. things. And a lot of these, or at least what I noticed, the people who get it quick or get it easy – you know, they kind of don't understand, like, do you know what it's like to not be able to do this and work right, at nine to five? Right, 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 like right. Like to work in Tesco's right. or something like that and, and not be able to follow your passion. You need to work triple as hard to maintain that. The guy that I follow and, and he's an inspiration to me and millions of people because he reminds me of that every single day is The Rock on the Instagram. Bro, he's incredible. I mean... The guy is a gazillionaire. He's a number one in the world. Yeah. And, and, and he wears a t-shirt that says the wolf is always scratching or something mm -hmm. like that. And he is constantly, and his, his, his studio or his media company is called Seven Bucks Production. Yeah, because yeah, the Everything's story Everything's a it. reminder yes. of what it's like to have when nothing. When he Seven Bucks and he was writing, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and, so and, crazy. And, and we don't, I mean, he knows. That's, that's why he works the same now when he's on top of the game as he did when he got evicted from his house when he was a kid. Wow. And you need to have that. That gives me shivers, man, just hearing that. It's, it's true. It's very true, man. We forget, uh, but I get, it's almost like this. We were having this debate because of, like, let, let, if we take our kids, for instance, we both have children now. Mashallah, you have beautiful children. And, yeah, um, broke to you as yeah, well. Exactly baby, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you're, you're at a stage now where, you know, your kids are, you know, getting schooled and educated and things like that. You as a parent, through the hardships you've been through, you don't want them to face the hardships you've faced. No. However, your hardships made you. So now, how do you battle the, you know, the, the one side of, you know, they need a bit of a raw street education, to, uh, you, but at the same time, you want them to have a nice life because you can't sugarcoat them. You can't, you can't like, you make the world seem like it's all pretty. And especially you being in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, you know, everything's like kind of just built. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, how do you deal with that? Like, how do you how do you give them those kind of life lessons? Is it through love and a relationship? And you know, is it just by speaking to them, or are they like kind of, you know, can you put them in environments that kind of allow them to think for themselves and act themselves as well? Well, see, the thing with being a parent is, no matter what environment you put them in, um, their first environment is at home. You know, the first the, their natural the environment is to go back to you know how their parents were acting, right. what their parents were doing. Um, for me. You know, the one trait that I take from my dad above everything is his work ethic. You know, my dad was come, came from a very, very poor background, you know, no shoes, you know, in the middle of the desert, you know, I mean, struggling to get an education. And um, he worked his ass off, man. He, he worked like crazy. He st I remember him studying all night just to get the credentials to be able to go up in his job. Um, and I'm talking about 3, 4 a.m. Just didn't stop. And I took that from him. I took that work ethic where my dad always, my dad never asked anyone for anything. Because he, he said, my work comes first. Everything else comes second. Wow. So there are three things that I want my kids to have that I hope I can give them in the home environment and that they can use in every environment. Number one is that everything, good or bad, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is Allah puts good in your path because you deserve it. Allah puts bad in your uh, hardships in your path so you can learn from it. But you keep moving forward. And the Allah is there with you. That's one thing that I always remember. That's that, so beautiful. That sort of gives me peace, right? So, for example, if you know I don't get an opportunity or I lose something, I know that Allah didn't want it for me because there's something better down the line. And don't you think just saying the word Alhamdulillah makes everything okay as well? Every day, man. Every second, every day. As much as you can. So that's number one. Uh, the second thing is work ethic. I don't care what he wants to do in his life. 
to be a ballet dancer. Uh, I have two boys. If they want to do in their life, if they want to be ballet dancers, if they want to do YouTubers, if they, if they want to be YouTubers, if they want to be athletes, if they would just want to have regular jobs. The only thing I will demand from them or ask of them is that they work as hard as they can. Put your heart and soul into it because I've never seen anyone put their heart into something and not succeed. And I'm Correct. talking about full on. I'm talking about no sleep, you know, everything is about that mission and vision that you have for the things you want to do in your life. That's all I want to see. If he comes to me and drops, says at ninth grade, 10th grade, dad, I want to drop out of school because I want to become a professional dancer. I'll be like, okay, where's your dance coach? Let me speak to your dance coach. Okay, dance coach, what do you think? He's great. He's great. Kharat. He's, he's, he, work, he gets up 4 a.m. every morning. He's in the, in the studio at 5. He, I have to kick him out. You know, he puts his heart and soul. I think he can get into one of the top universities. We have shows lined up for him. Why would I stand in the way of that? Wow. And you know, bro, I love the way of thinking uh, of that kind of mindset because you have right now, for instance, like I, I think that kind of ties into the question I was asking as well, is because you, that gives you the opportunity at that point to say, okay, you're now old enough to be able to, you know what you're fighting for. You've decided what you're fighting yeah. for because it comes from your heart. So now... You no, know, I want to see what you can do with it. What have you learned from your life and how are you going to apply it? I'm going to give you the freedom to do so. And, you know, win or lose. So, for instance, you want at that point, because of their hard work, they're going to work, you know, 100 hours or something for one specific thing, like maybe one show. Yeah. And they might not get the audition. You know what I mean? But how do they deal with that failure? Now, you can't be there as a parent and be like, oh, it's okay. I did it. All this kind of stuff. You got to be like, you know what? do another 100 hours like we have this psychology at my company as well which is like we, we have to pitch to brands often you know yeah. we have to literally go out of our way to create content to then go and pitch to them just for them to say no <laughs> but my thing is is when and, and I, i've had situations with my team where they've you know done like five like done five pitches or whatever and they're like oh my no one's getting back to us or no one said yeah i'm like bro we got 95 more to go there we go you know what i mean and out of those 95 we might get one mm. or we might not but either way you're winning because you're learning Boy. so but Instilling that mindset is so important because you see everything as win-win. Yeah. Even um, so, a good friend of mine is uh, 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 Quincy in LA, and he's like uh, one of Puff Daddy's sons. Mm. So um, when I got a chance to go out to America, I spent some time at their house and uh, with them as well. And it, even him, he's he's one of the most successful guys in the world. You know, Forbes Rich List every year, and um, his mindset is, as a someone who's well off, you know, I've done well. And but my family, of course, I'm gonna look after them. So, for instance, he makes sure you know their mothers have a nice house. You know, what I mean, they've got you know they've got everything they need to be able to, you know, education wise, get themselves on their feet. Yep. You know, but once they get to a certain point and they want to start achieving their dreams, he's like, look, look, you got to fight for yourself. Yeah. I'm not giving you a penny. You've got to do this, and you've got to fight, and you've got to make it work. You have the luxury of the fact that I'm your father, and you can get in touch with people if you need to get in touch with yep. them. Then I'm your work. library. Yeah. But use it and be Fine. smart with it. I'm not just gonna give you handouts. And that's so important because it's almost like everything almost we're building now mm. in terms of contacts, education, you know, everything we're learning. If your child comes to ask you a question, even something basic about tax, you could advise them. Yes. You know, that's asset. But then yep. they've got to go out and, and do something with it. So, you know, I think, I think that's very, very important, man. man uh, I mean, because the thing is, if you talk about that 100 hours and didn't, and didn't make it, right? Uh, you know, what, what do those 100 hours build in someone? A work ethic that can be translated to anything. Okay, you know, if, 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 if he's there, he might not be a rocket scientist because, you know, he didn't get the education and stuff. He was more focused on other things. But he can, that can be translated into different areas and different right, things. Right. You know, to be a coach, to be anything else, you know. For, for you know, work ethic is something I'm always going to pride myself on because you know my mom when i was growing up as a student she said look i, I just want your best that's it what did your mom do my what mom was, was my mom was um for a lot of my childhood she was at home she was uh, taking care of uh, me and my brothers and i and then she became uh, a nurse and in, in a, in, in a in dentist in uk yeah. no uh before she would work at, when she was in scotland she was in a uh working i believe in an old person's home okay uh to save up money to come here so yeah, I mean, the very very humble background. Yeah, and very, I mean, we, we they got nothing. My parents and your father. What was his, his trade? Accounting. Mashallah. He's an accountant. Yeah. Are you good at maths? I'm I'm awful. <laughs> uh, like I, I'm I'm the worst at maths. You know, even even uh, what's his name that uh, Shack Road Shack or whatever his name is. Two know. plus two quick maths. You know that guy. Uh, no, 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 no. Shack. No. Come on, you, you, how do you not no. know him? The twinkles. 
Oh, yeah, that guy. Um, one plus oh, yeah, one Shaka, is Roadman, two. Shaka. Yeah, Rodo Shaka. Bro, yeah. Michael Dapper. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's probably better yeah, at math. We than no, because in the UK, everyone called it, he, he was known before that as well as Michael Dapper. Oh, okay. So when we were the Road Man Shaka, like, it doesn't have to think about it for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, he, yeah, he's so funny. The yeah. stuff he's done there, man. Like, absolutely, like, planting like a crater in the world with this kind of. Oh culture, my god, yeah. he's crazy! I see him everywhere, popping up on my Insta yeah. feed and all that stuff. It's incredible, man. So okay, so so now you've you you've left you've left um, you know. Did you finish uh, college? Yeah, yeah, I finished right. college. Yeah. And then you went to university? Uh, yeah, I went to Northumbria for my degree. Was that journalism? Uh, no. Okay. Again, in, in marine operations. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. so... Uh, you took a complete U-turn somewhere. I just yeah, want yeah. to find out where. Right, Let's you're get to that the bit. U-turn, right? <laughs> so I came back... Uh, so after I came back from the UK, I started writing for uh, the national newspaper. Okay. Just I came... Where, which, which one? It's the, Nas- it's the Abu national... Abu Dhabi newspaper. Okay, okay, okay. Um, uh, it was a, it's an English newspaper in Abu Dhabi and one day I got home and I saw this article that was written about UAE people from here and I said I want to write a response to it so that night I stayed up and I wrote an article sent it in two weeks it was published Mashallah. and uh, ever since then I was addicted not just to the, the, the writing to be able to speak and express yourself uh, through the written word but also in the engagement and the dialogue that was happening after it so uh, I just got into journalism by myself uh, never trained, um, just always wrote from my heart. And uh, I think it was just something, yani, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you asked, you know, are you good at math? I'm, I'm, I'm horrible at math. Uh, but I think in terms of like speaking and communication and writing and stuff like that, I think I've always like had a kind of a natural knack for it. Mm. Uh, never trained. Wow, that's incredible. And so, so when uh, after university, when you uh, uh, obviously this, this was junior university, you did this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just to do, uh, so no, this was after university. Uh, after university, uh, so so what kind of how how was your career path after that? Because I what I'm what I know about you from the kind of the brief education I've had. Yeah, yeah. Um, is you know you've and I don't know if I'm missing a big gap here, but you're working at a company. Yeah. Uh, you know, you were offered a, a, a pay rise, a promotion. Yeah, yeah. And this was literally last year. And the reason I want to touch on this because it aligns so much with the timing of what happened in my life as well. So I started my company just about a year ago as well. And that was again a leap of, and I heard, heard in your video where you were saying, you, you know, you spoke to your wife and you were like, you know what, like, is it a risk I take or do I just become that guy that just is always doing this? Mm. And I was freelancing at the time as a designer and I was like, do I just carry on doing this now or do I actually create some stability? Yeah. You know, do I build something that is hard work but can actually have longevity for us? Yeah. And again, she supported me, alhamdulillah, with that as well. So that was a year ago, am I right? Uh, yeah, 2016. Okay, yep. so, so, so how did that, you know, so did you start get into work in journalism like almost immediately after that? No, so when I came back from college in 2006, I was okay. working a day job. Right. It's a normal job, an investment company, okay. and I would write in the evenings. Okay. All right, so I was never, I was, a, I was a contributor and did some presenting and stuff like that. So the journalism was basically, I made myself a journalist. No one gave me a business card and a job offer said you're a journalist now. All right, which again is another thing I think is changing. Like, how do you define? Like, you don't need to be told you're a, prese- you're a radio presenter for you to go and start your own podcast. No, you just <laughs> yeah, get some microphones true. to start your own podcast. It's There's true, no man. rule it's book true. here. It's true. So for me, it was in 2000. Uh, so in, I did 2006 to 2012. I was working in an investment company. Imagine me sitting in a cubicle doing spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations, like consultant, investment banker wow, type work. Wow. I was awful at it. So when I say awful, it means it, not that I didn't perform. It means what it, it, if it, someone who's good at it, it took them maybe half an hour to do something, it'd take me two or three hours to do the same okay. task. So I'd have to work triple as hard to stay on par with everyone else. And that's something that we need to think about when we go into these things, when we think, okay, I'll be successful as an accountant. But if you're a crappy accountant, you're setting yourself up for failure, not success. Correct, correct, correct. So in, 2000 and I needed, in 2012, I said, enough. But I had Khalifa, my eldest son at the time, was about three years old. And Salama, my wife, was pregnant with Abdullah, our second baby. And, you know, when you talk about taking a leap of faith, think about taking that leap of faith when you have a wife, a son, and, and, and another son on the way. So when you jump off that building or that leap of faith, you're dragging your wife and your kid, your pregnant right, wife and right, your, right, your right. son. So your, your kid with you. So... It needed to be not just a calculated risk, a, a very, very, very calculated risk. So I thought for me, I needed a reset on my life. So I applied to uh, business school and I went to business school. To, we went to the stage for two years. 
We lived in California, and I thought that's going to be my reset. Stanford, right? Stanford, yeah. So uh, I did a business school, and then I did a lot of minors there in like journalism and communication and stuff. I don't think you just say you went to Stanford in passing conversation. <laughs> you had to stop there. Sure. So how do you even go, how do you even get to Stanford? How, what even comes into your mind? Because you know, like I I, I tried going to university when I was nineteen, a part time in the evenings. It didn't help. But then I got put off because the books they were teaching me business from were written in 1992. And I was like, listen, this doesn't apply right now. And I was running a business at the time. So I was just annoyed and I left. So, but I do actually have a part of me that's like, you know what, one day I would like to go to a university like that for the experience and education of what it brings. So, you know, what went to your mind to even do that at that time? Because you, you're an MBA yeah. from Stanford from graduate, Stanford, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, for me... Uh, so my undergrad wasn't that strong. So uh, that was a marine uh, marine operations. operations yeah. You know, I mean, your opportunities are somewhat limited. So I always knew I needed a higher education, something more broad that that could open doors for me. Um, I applied to four universities the year before I applied to Stanford, okay. or four or five, and I got like rejected from pretty much all of them. One I got conditional acceptance in, um, and. You know, I went back home and I told my wife, I still want to do this. And I always dreamed of going to Stanford. It was a dream of mine to go there. How I was going to get there, I don't know, but I wanted to be there. So she got, I got back home and I said, I want to apply again. She's like, look, Khaled, if you're going to apply again, enough with the BS. Apply to the school that you want to go and not to the school that you don't think, not to the schools that you think you have the best chance of getting into. Okay. Because I didn't have a great GPA, my standardized but, And again, that's, that's playing to the kind of thing you're saying about the accountancy thing. It's like just doing it because you think you're going yes. to do it, but yeah, not yeah. to the best. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I applied to Stanford. Um, I got all the help. I reached out to people. I Again, people think they need to do these things alone. You don't. I had a lot of help, a lot of mentorship on... On, on the whole process, so how I could get the best out of it. Because it's, if it's your one shot, you want to make sure that you've you know, exhausted every resource and every uh, thing that you have. Um, so I didn't have a good test scores. I didn't really have a great GPA. I didn't have like some classy background. Uh, what I had my, were my essays. And again, this comes back to the writing and sort of like expressing yourself. And for me, it was, it was very much, you know, working with people to help me tell my story in the best way possible, because we're we're humble people, like we're we all like we're taught humility, but you know in some cases, yeah, you need to celebrate the things that you've done in life, especially to other people when you're trying to get into their school. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> right? So I was able to do that. So we relied on on the essays to uh, to sort of open that path. And um, you know, I envisioned myself there, Umar. Wallah, like no. And I'm, when I say envision myself, I didn't imagine myself just there. I imagine myself walking over around campus. I imagine wow, myself, wow. you know, sitting in class. I imagine myself coming home to Sanama and the kids. I imagine myself graduating. I imagine myself 10 years later doing an interview and thanking the university for what they had done for Did me. Did you imagine singing a podcast with me like this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right there with a guy called Omar. <laughs> but, but I think that that helps, man. That helps when you're in the process and writing things because you don't write as in you're asking permission to get in there. You're writing as if you're already there and you, you let others envision that with you so they think right. this, 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 this young lady or this young man is already here. They know. And um, I'll never forget the day I got the call to say I was accepted, man. Uh, wow, I just gotten I just gotten out of uh, it was the day before we get the call. Uh, we, the day they send emails, so it was the day before we were gonna get the email. And um, I had I was in the car with Sanama, and Khalifa was sitting in the back in his car seat, <coughs> and I went to the mosque uh, to pray Maghrib, and I kept Sanama and uh, Khalifa in the car, and I left my phone in the car. Because you don't want to be the guy in the mosque whose phone goes off and get all the nice stares at the end judging you. So, so you I, know what? I remember. You know, remember when the crazy frog ringtone came out? Oh remember no! I, and I, I heard that once. And I started laughing so much. Did it happen in the mosque? Yeah, yeah. But it ding 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 ding. See, sometimes, sometimes, like you have these people. At least I know in the mosques where 
you know, it'll be ringing, but their, you know, their, their iman is so strong, they ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so they just let it go. So was it kind of like, did the whole thing or did he actually go in his pocket? And I can't remember, I was too young. I was like a kid then. I remember going with my dad for Juma and then hearing it. And I've also seen once a guy who actually like <laughs> answered it just so someone could hear the imam reciting. So they knew that he was in the mosque. Oh, like, no. <laughs> and that bro just called him back. <laughs> and, and, and the thing is, is if it's on, if you hit like speaker by mistake, yo, bruv. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. bruv. <laughs> 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 and it's like something that's not supposed to be said. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> What's this guy doing here? Yeah, exactly. I see you at the bar after. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're late for the pub, mate. <laughs> you know, so, so. But I remember getting out of the mosque and then I um, I checked my phone and I don't know if, I, I, I don't know. It's not like WhatsApp, no, a voice note or something. It was an actual voicemail. And okay. in our culture, we don't leave voicemails. You know, we don't, we don't leave, you either call me back or you send a text. Right. But this was a voicemail. So I was driving and I checked the voicemail. And I was driving at the time down the road uh, with Kharif in the back, Saddam on the side. And I get the call, put my earpiece in. Or get the voice note, put my earpiece in. And it's like, uh, uh, good evening, uh, Khalid. Uh, would just like to congratulate and welcome uh, Salama and yourself to the Stanford School of Business. Oh, did your wife apply as well? Uh, no, oh, but, but just, they're, okay. they're, very, they're very family orientated right, see, place, see, you know, see. so they wanted to welcome the family. Beautiful. And Umar, I, I went stiff. I pulled over. Excuse me. I pulled over and I was in like complete shock. And I looked at Sarama and she looked at me with this like, kind of fear. She's like, what's wrong? I'm like, we got in. And she's like, we got in where? And then, like, what's going on? Look at yourself. And I opened the thing and, and there was like bubble, like tears coming in my eyes. I'm like, we got into Stanford. And she's like, oh, oh, oh no. And she starts crying and we both start crying together. And then we look back and the Kharifa looks at us. Our son, he's like, maybe I should start <laughs> crying too. And he starts crying as well. And, and for me, it was like after my wedding and the birth of my kids, uh, that was like probably one of the greatest moments of my life, Yanni. It was really wow. like I knew that things were going to be, at least professionally, that things were going to be okay. Bro, once you've been to Stanford, listen, you game over. <laughs> <laughs> like they, put you, no, they put you through the meat grinder there. Right. For sure. Like, I mean, it was the hardest. What, what did you study there? What was your MBA? What, what, what was it? Was it just a business? Uh, yeah, a general degree? business degree. Okay, cool. uh, but I did a lot of classes in, in like the digital media school and communications nice, nice. And, and entertainment and stuff like that. But you get through the meat grinder, man. It's wow. it's it's. I mean, that's the interview process. Uh, no, the, the whole process. Oh wow! I mean, uh, it's how the long most were you there for? Uh, two years. Wow. Okay. Uh, but like, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was the hardest and biggest challenge of my life, the most meaningful, um, and I'll, uh, yeah, I mean, it's changed my life professionally. Uh, like and to a big extent, personally, like nothing else in the world. So now you're now. So now you're in a different kind of ship altogether. Yeah. You know? So so what 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 did you learn there? That in terms of you know, because now I, I assume you're around a different set of people with different mindsets. Um, what did you pick up from that experience? You know, what did you learn about yourself? What did you go through? Because that's, that's a massive transformation as yeah. well from what you were doing before to that. Did you learn a lot about yourself? Did you yeah. discover who you are? And, and 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 also, I think there's a point in in people's lives where you go through this period of like seeing yourself from an outward perspective. Yeah. Where you you're living your life just being you, and you get to a point, and maybe I haven't been through that fully yet because I'm still so young. But I uh, remember I, I, like a couple of years ago, I went through a point when I was literally took myself out of my body and looked at myself, and I was like, hmm, would I want to be friends with myself? Yeah. Kind of type of thing. I'm like, did you go through a point, you know, any time during that period where you were like, you know, you questioned yourself or you discovered yourself? Did that happen at all? Yeah, man. Every day there, you know, I mean, you're talking about being in a place where every day you're learning. Every day, you know, you're challenged. Um, I think three things I realized about myself. I think first and foremost that I was a pretty bad husband and father. Wow. Um, you know... The first year that I was there, it was uh, that we were all in the States, is I was having a tough time in university. I mean, it's, it's Stanford for a reason because they, they, they don't take it easy. <laughs> and uh, I, I had a tough time. I was on academic probation for um, 
you know, the first couple of quarters. So I would spend all day in the library and completely, and like complete, I, this is like, like one of the first times I'm saying this, but like, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat, I think I neglect, I see, even I'm trying to sugarcoat it by saying I think. I neglected my responsibilities as a husband and a father. I forgot that my wife, who was brave enough to come all the way there with me, because staying here was an option, you know, staying here with the kids and I go and we visit each other. But that she was brave enough to come all the way to America by herself with a three-year-old and a three-month-old and um, do everything in terms of being a parent. I think that that is one of like the self-realizations that I had that hurts the most looking back. Um that I forgot what was important. That, I, okay, I needed to pass to provide for my family, but I needed- Not at the expense, not of, at the expense of my family. Not, that, not to that extent right. where, like my wife and I didn't went out once the first year for dinner, once. Like that's, that's not right. I don't care what you're working for. Uh, you need to give time to your wife. You need to give time. Uh, like she deserved it. Yes. And uh, that's one of the like, things that I'm, kind of ashamed that I think the second thing uh, so that's what that's why like I think a lot of people that follow me see a, a, a big change in who I am as a parent and that's, as a that's what intrigued me so much bro is like th- the stuff I've seen of you and the time you spend with your family is mashallah so admirable thank you and man. incredible like it is it, it, one of my notes actually as well is because you know I've just had a daughter as well and when when I'm thinking about, you know, I've always had this, I remember two years ago, before I even got married, I'd speak to my now mother-in-law and I'd say, you know, mom, you know, when I get married, you know, and you know, I want to do this, 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 because when I, we have a child, inshallah, I want to be this type of father. And she would like laugh and say, oh my, like, you're t- thinking too deep into things and everything. And I was like, no, I have to think about it now. Yeah. So just to get my mind right. And now we have her, it's literally, when you look at her, you're like, wow, like, I, I didn't even know you were going to be here like as you but I've been thinking about you for so long because of the type of father I want to be uh-huh. and I see you in so many ways actually being that you know because she's so young right now that you know there's only so much you can do for her but or with her but like, when I see the stuff of you know you're just swimming with your kids or you're yeah. just like going for runs with them and these kind of things bro it's so beautiful because these are the smallest things yeah. that are, are, are big holes in people's lives and I have friends that are very successful professionally you know, and, you know, and humble as well. You know, they're not even bad people. However, sometimes the decision making will affect their family, you know, and I never want to be of that kind of nature that it does that. I never want it to be at the expense of my family. So I was very curious to understand where that came from. Because yeah. I don't, I, 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 as beautiful as it is, I don't believe people are just born with that. I think yeah. you have to go through something yeah. to make you appreciate it. Was, was that that point? Yeah, that, that was the point for sure. Really? And yeah. does it remind you of it every time? Like, do you literally look at your wife and kids and think, you know what? I owe it to you to be a better husband, father every day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, and that was the worst point in Sanama and I's marriage as well. I mean, it was every, everything just, like, per- personally, everything was just bad. Yeah, right. There was nothing really good. Sanama didn't enjoy her time there. She didn't like me, <laughs> you know, um, and I wasn't, you know, aware enough or self-aware enough to, to, right. to do anything. For me, it was just I needed to pass at Stanford to be able to, sustain my family that was my justification um you know and it was important like i mean i didn't want to be a failure to them like get kicked out of university because i wasn't good academically right and then be a failure for the rest of my life right yeah you were the oh you were the guy that got accepted but just didn't make it yes yes that's my dad yeah that's my dad and and again i look back would have gotten to that extent if i had just taken the the gas off a little bit on the academic side and just focused on family. Do you think it would have been possible though for you to achieve what you did at Stanford if, you know, as, as hard as it is, if you hadn't gone through those struggles? Like, do you think that was almost a part of a price you had to pay? Yeah. 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 I th- I, I, on reflection. When I look back, I, I'm try- I try to think of, of how I could have made it through those courses without neglecting my family. And, and it's hard to say, but I can't think of a way because it's not like I was... I was ditching them because I was out, you know, at a party or... No, I was in the library. 
You know, I was just, that's all, that's, I lived in the library. Wow. I don't, don't you think it's so beautiful how this, I love the idea of the unknown to an extent that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, the day after, or next year, or the rest of our lives. Now, Allah, our creator, knew at the time that you would be going through this situation, blessed you with a beautiful wife, children, marriage, happy home, mashallah. Now an opportunity to go. So it's all these things that people would be like, you know what, I'd love to be him. You know, from an outside perspective. Yeah, but then internally, you're dealing with a test. Now, this is something that is so common. And the reason it relates to, you know, social media and today is because we have this outwardly, you know, uh, perception that goes out of, you know, who we are. Like, maybe 15% of our life is social media. The rest of it, we live behind it. But yet, people will literally look at that as they might have looked at you being at Stanford and be like, wow, man, I'd love that. I love. But the battles you deal with inside are things that, you know, nobody can even sometimes you know, relate to or even believe. Yeah. So like, I'm, I'm just like, that, that's what is kind of, I think is incredible that all these things we don't know are going to happen. And yeah. we think at the time that these are so beautiful, but then as soon as you get to that point where you're like, yo, this is great. It's like, hold on, there's a catch. But that catch is your test. To, and that allowed you yeah, to now, um, now look what it's done. Like that's bought you, that you don't know by you going through that and, and your wife's patience and understanding and compromise, how much you guys be rewarded for what it does to generations of your kids. And another, so, I know that's deep, but bro, but what you now can do for your kids because of that education will now affect how they treat their kids and their kids and their kids. And imagine a story you can tell, you know, they, they can tell their, ki- uh, their kids about their grandfather, you know? Dude, it's, uh, and, and the thing that, 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 that I like to think about is like, you know, the calm after the storm. Like, you know, Sarama and I have seen the worst of each other. All right? Or we, we've seen what a awful marriage can look like. The worst marriage. One where we just don't pay attention to each other. One where we neglect each other. One where, you know, we just don't, we're not happy. Um... And I've seen what it's like to be at the bottom because I was in the lowest 10% of my class. So, you know, going through those struggles, you know, like, I want, yani, everything is, is, uh, is, in the, is, is made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to decisions. But, like, because we've seen the worst of each other and made it through, like, what, what's, what, there's no down it's now. They say as well, if you can handle my worst, you can, you can handle yeah, my best. My best. Like, something yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a... Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> if you can handle me at my worst, no, if you if you can't, if you handle, can't handle me at my worst, worst you don't deserve, deserve me at my worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's incredible. Got but um, I don't know if it was Whitney Houston who said that, but I don't know. <laughs> something, yeah. something she might say. <laughs> Some, something I saw when I was looking for a motivational quote <laughs> yeah, on Google. Yeah, yeah. But but for me, it's um, it's like literally Sanama and I have no fear of being apart. Like divorce. Like I mean, we reached a point of divorce a couple times, you know, during that time. Like, we're not afraid. Like, we're just at that stage where we're just happy all the time. And I'm still so young. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> like, so now we get to enjoy. But, but again, on, on your point on social media and stuff, that's, that's a lot of the stuff that I try to share. Like, okay, there's a nice picture. But what I always try and share in the stories is what it took to get there. Yes. Uh, so a lot of my stuff shares that. So anyone says, like, you're a lovey-dovey couple. I'm like, did you read anything I wrote? <laughs> you know, because I think what's important is, is to people to understand that no, it is a lot of work. It's context, bro. Yeah, every picture has context behind it. There you go. You know, and that I, mean, I, I like. I like the way you could you because you do write long captions, and I, and I do that on mine as well. And I feel like those work really well because you can give a lot more of the story behind it and say, look, this is the picture that depicts X, but this is the story behind it, and this yes. is what really went down, and this is how I thought and what I went through. What even made you want to get onto social media in the first place? How long have you been on there for now? Well, I, was, I started on Twitter maybe six, seven years ago. Well, okay. Facebook, I just got my, was that, I've been on for like eight years or something. Right. So I was, I was on Facebook fairly early when I was in the UK. Um, Twitter, I got into it when I started the journalism. And then, you know, Snapchat and Instagram really for me just took off when I got back from the States. Wow. Like just a couple of years. So this has, it's not been a, it's been work, but on different platforms over like the past eight years. Uh, in some shape or form, yeah. And so, and when did you, when did you notice that the message you're putting across is actually valued by people and important for them to hear? Because I I went through that phase when I was like just you know just Snapchatting and doing my thing just for for like just putting it out there. And it got to a point when I was like, okay, hold on a second, this is actually something fresh for people that like they can actually benefit from it. Yeah. 
um, what, what, when did you get to that point when, when, cause I suppose that plays a big part in what you're doing now because of the speaking and everything as well. I think when you get some DMs and stuff, you know, I think that's sort of like, for me, that was a bit wild, like, uh, getting some DMs of people saying, I'm actually going to take this. Or when you give like advices on Snapchat or Insta story, uh, you're getting people screenshotting them and, and keeping them in their notes or they take a picture of, of notes that they've printed out, um, come up to you in public and just say, man, thanks for that. Uh, when they get called to the university to actually build on what you were talking about on social media, you know, I mean, that's that's huge. I mean, I think the biggest one, at least the one that sticks out for me, is um, Salama uh, has a skin condition called vitiligo. That means that she has white patches all over her body. Right, right. And I remember I did a, a someone said to me, uh, sent me a message after like she was in one of my stories and she has like a big big white mark on her foot and someone said uh, because a lot of she's covered obviously so you can only see uh, the one on her foot you can see her fingertips you can see her eye I'm trying to think what other parts of yeah so you can see the eye one of her eyelids is white uh, her fingertips are all white right. and she has a big white patch on her foot in addition to other parts in her body, but you don't see that. Okay. Um, so someone sent me a, a message like, Khalid, like w- there's this great treatment and if your wife want to look good again and stuff like, like those words. Like if you want, your wife wants to look natural and good again, we have this treatment cream for you. I have an insult though as well. You know, you know backhanded. <laughs> like, man, I want to jump through this one and slap <laughs> you, man. Like, I'm sure, th- I mean, I want to give the person the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure they went well, but right. it's just maybe they didn't. They need a good course on communication. Right, right, like right. <laughs> but it's, uh, they needed something, you know, advertising wasn't their best. Exactly. <laughs> but, but like, I got a lot of... Imagine that on TV, if you want to look good again. <laughs> <laughs> if you feel bad about yourself, and so you should. <laughs> no, but f- for me, for me, uh, and, and then, you know, I try not to just go on one DM. Like someone says... Khalid, you should shave your beard. And then I'd start doing this whole thing about yeah, beards, you know? But a lot of people were saying, getting at me with like solutions and creams and makeup. So I said, all right, that's enough. I'm like, I married my wife the way she is. She is perfect to me the way she is. Beautiful. I don't need some treatment for her. If she wants to do it, that's her decision. My wife, I get, she has complete... She is her own woman in this relationship. She is her own independent woman in this relationship. You know, people say, how do you empower your wife? Like, I don't want to empower my wife. She empowers herself. I just stay out of her way. That's how I empower my wife. I, I Give her the I, freedom to be her and empower herself. Yeah, but even, see, I even get worried about using terminology like that. I'm not, I give her the freedom. Who uh, am I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, no, correct, you, you correct, know what correct, I'm correct. saying? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, no, because, I mean... In this day and age, you say a yeah, sentence yeah, like right, that, people are like, right, right. oh, really? What put you in that position? I'm up with all the yeah, trolls yeah. and everything <laughs> coming at you. No, no, but, but I've learned that, that but, I need- bro, 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 do you know how amazing it is? Like, touching on that real quick, if you even go down to like, uh, no, for, like when I got married, um, people, uh, I was the whole thing about like the name change thing. I went to look deep into it. It's actually better for a woman not to change her name because she's not ownership of the man, even after marriage. You, know, yeah. you, you don't own her. Yeah. Be, uh, like, I know it sounds crazy, but like by changing the name, it has that connotation. Yeah. You know what I mean? So even through our religion, it's like, you, you, you know, you're not necessarily advised to even do that yeah, yeah. Uh, for that reason. So no. like all these oppressive things are so like... No, my, my, like my wife hasn't changed her name. Like my wife does... My wife, we have a relationship where we do things together, but she's an independent woman, man. Um, she's a strong independent woman that does her thing that has her life that has her future that has her goals and ambitions independent of me all right we have goals for each other we have goals for our relationship we have ambitions to be a certain type of parents to our kids but she has her own dreams in life and that that doesn't stop because she's married to me or becomes a mother of course um so i was getting all these dms about like how she can change herself and stuff i was like okay this is it so I said to people, I, I did a Snap story uh, or an Instagram story where I said to people, why? I married her the way she is. I love her the way she is. She's perfect to me the way she is. I don't want anything to change. I even tell her, look, if you, cha- if you want to change these things, that's your body. That's your decision. But if, you, if my opinion plays any part in it, please don't because you're perfect the way you are and that's who I, I want to stay with. 
Um, even to the point that, like, before I used to kiss her on the white eyelid, not the other one. I would just like consistently kiss her on that That's white beautiful. eyelid when, when we when we first got married. Um, it's just something. It was nice to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember that night after we put the Insta story out, uh, a, a young man uh, sent a, a video direct message, and he was in the camera, so it was selfie mode, and he had vitiligo all over his face. And he's like, Khalid, you know, I talked about how people are beautiful, the importance of it, you know, not judging, um, how, you know, how we look on the inside doesn't matter. Yani. And he took a DM video of himself, vitiligo all over his face. He's like, Khalid, because of the message that your wife and yourself had put out, I'm going out the house now for the first time without makeup. Wow. So he would spend hours well. just putting makeup. Well, because he wants to make the skin... One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's when I knew that that like the message is, is, is powerful. Yeah, I so beautiful. And, bro, and even even taking a situation like that and like looking at the from an optimistic point of view and being like, you know what? Bro, even being able to say, Alhamdulillah, I have this and not el- something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, bro, like, even that is like, man, like, come on. like, And even for you to have that impact, to allow someone to do that, have the confidence to do that, bro, you inspired that. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and again, now that's allowed you to do so many other things to have that constant, like, kind of, bro, just even the fact that we're sitting here is because of that. You know, people being impacted and being like, yo, this is the guy. You know what I mean? Like, as humble as you are, like, Alhamdulillah. It's, it's, it's beautiful that people, and, and we really need young leaders and young people that and, and, and having access to like you know these platforms online yeah. we have to have a sense of responsibility with it to be Absolutely. like you know what we represent a, we represent a culture and a notion right now that is being you know demonized constantly in the media around the world everywhere you know as sad as it is and it's not this extreme but it, it can happen we have a my brother runs an arabic clothing line right okay so it's called izaha and we literally have like um messages of endearment in arabic so for example, we have a hat that says uh, salam, another one that says hub, and like all these different things. And like, like, yeah. <laughs> nice. So all these different things. So we, um, another one says habibi on, on the All right, top. yeah. So you, you take these out. Now, there's been situations where I've gone on the London Underground and wore a hat that says salam on it, but it's a black hat with white Arabic text. Oh, God. You see what people yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. So it is just so crazy. So, so, but these are type of things that are just like wired into people's brains. And I... And, Literally, little things like that make me think that if I can just have an impact on one person that can maybe speak to someone else and say, you know what? Look, there's some people out there that are trying to shed a positive light on young Muslims or, you know, young Asians or, you know, just, just people, just young people, you know, who are actually just trying to be great, who are actually feel trapped a lot of times. Mm. Because there's huge issues that aren't spoken about, like mental health, for instance. Okay. You know, it's not even touched on. And if it is, it's a huge taboo because the generation above us, for instance, our parents, or even like our grandparents, to them it would be like, you know what, we're built strong, you know what I mean? It doesn't exist. It's you not need to pray thing. more. You need yeah, to you pray, pray more. more. What's anxiety? You got, you know, a gin or this. And it's like, you know, this is a real situation. People go through, and yes, you can't explain anxiety. You can't explain why people get it, but they get it and it affects them. So how do you deal with that? And by having situations like this, conversations like this, platforms like this, we're able to at least say, you know what, it's okay. Because that guy, for instance, with the vitiligo might have felt that anxiety, social anxiety by going out. But by seeing something you did, it may be able to overcome that. And hopefully by now has helped other people overcome it. Yep. These are small chain reactions that we can create. So, Bro, like, I want to come back to your point on, you know, you wear that hat and someone sees it on the London Underground. Why do they know? Why do they associate that with that? Mm. Why do they associate that hat with the flag that we're talking about? You know, I don't want to say it on your right, podcast right. because yeah, I don't yeah, want yeah. to give it. Because it's in their face every single day. Constant. Anything. And the irony is, it says peace. Yeah, no, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's no, no, so crazy. No, but, uh, like a Muslim <laughs> farts the wrong way in public <laughs> and they get that flag up. <laughs> yeah. is, is he a member of this? No, yeah, yeah. It's every day in your face. Right. And that's why the work that you're doing it's so important. And for me, it's like people say, like, I'm sure you'll, I don't know if you've gotten already, but Amar, enough with the positive stuff, enough with yes, the yes, every, yes. no, no, whoever's saying that needs to shut up. Why? Because these people that are trying to do evil in our world or these pri- people who are trying to make us look bad in the world aren't taking any breaks. They're working overtime, man. They're putting out messages every day. That's why when someone sees your cap, it's stuck in their head exactly because that's what they see every single day. We need to be working overtime too. Positive messages, good messages, inspirational messages every day. 
overtime because they're not taking breaks. They are not taking any breaks. And the minute that we say, we, we go weak to these people who are saying, yeah, shut up with all the positive stuff. Don't you ever have a bad day? Like, yeah, I have shitty days, man. But I'm not going to let that stop me from putting out these messages. you're fighting for something. Exactly. You have a purpose. Yeah. Exactly. So, so keep doing the work that you're doing, man. Because cause something has to counter, something has to be a right. counterbalance, uh, counter all these messages. Correct, correct. And then, and then not enough, like, you don't get enough of the the mainstream attention as you should on those kind. And I'm not saying like oh, you want it, but I'm just saying it's it's just funny how you have like one side of the story and then have the other side of the story of like you know look at what there are people out there doing. You know, like they're trying to create this. Sort of, even we were trying to launch something, and I was like, you know what? I I have I have a friend that um, is a news anchor for ITV, mm. and even I, I I messaged her as well, and I said, you know what? Like uh, I'm going to be doing this thing soon and i love for you guys cover it and i haven't i haven't even launched the thing yet so i don't want to speak too much on it but even just having that conversation it was like yeah i'm not sure if that will like fit into bro i was like man and you know it's not her fault but she knows already if she takes to the producers or whatever it's not even gonna get commissioned i was like this is just absolutely uh, insane man you know what man you work until the point that they're calling you, man. Bro, All that's right? it, man. That's, that's it. it. Man, you, we create our own media platforms. Thank you. That's right? it. Look at it. We're on a podcast now it, it, that was put together through Instagram that was... Dude, t- leave the middleman out, man. True, I true. mean, if they don't get on board with this stuff now, any company that's not getting on board with it now is going to get left behind because Correct. YouTube, podcasts, you know, uh, you know, mobile phones, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, you know, whatever you want, those are taking over. All right? And you're the type of person that's leading the charge. So... Just work, man. Like for me, I've like, and this is personal. Maybe it changes in the future because I don't want to. I don't want to um, come back on my words. But at this point in my life, you know, I'm done with traditional media. Mm. I, I don't like. Someone says some TV guy some comes and says, "Look, we got good exposure for you. We can give you good exposure on this TV channel." Man, I'm good exposure for me. Right, right, if right, I right, put right. This right. video and put it on YouTube, put it on my Twitter, put it on my Instagram. I'm good exposure for me. Right, right. I don't right. need your channel. I can do it myself. I put in eight years of work to build this audience. I can do it myself. Correct. If someone has an idea for a series, okay, let's talk. Which platform? YouTube? Instagram? Facebook? Where are we putting it? You know, face, these, these companies, like now I'm in the Facebook uh, media partner program. Inshallah. Like they're, 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 they're supporting creators to do their own content because that's what's winning, man. Of course, of and course. So if, ITP do, if ITV don't want to cover, get a few people for, who have got their own Facebook YouTube channels, uh, channels yeah, YouTube yeah, yeah. channel. Get them to come and yeah. cover it and it'll probably do even better, man. 100%. I, I brought, and it does paint this because now you create these platforms like these podcasts and stuff. Uh, how are podcasts supported? Through sponsorship. Yeah. And you choose who the brand you want to work with. Exactly. So now people get in touch and be like, you know, let's, you know, once, and it also gives us a chance to elevate our own brands. Absolutely. So, you know, use this platform to, you know, touch on the, you know, we're here at the Creative Lab, you know what I mean? Like, they, they can be a part of this. We, we run our own companies, they can be a part of this. So, these are all things that we can help push out. And then within those companies that we're building ourselves, create a culture yep. and lead people that can then go and make impact themselves as well. So, that's, bro, that's, ex- and, and that exactly what we're speaking about is why. I even set up the agency I have now there you go. is because as our um, personal brands grew so my wife has a, a big online following my brand started growing and my mashallah. brother mashallah, has a good following as well this was just like the closest people to me and then what started happening is eight years ago my sister did work experience for a major publication in the UK yep. print publication and they treated her like crap they literally were like, you know, drive all the way over here to East London, and we were in West London, to go pick up this fabric to bring it back to me, X, Y, and they didn't even use it. And she would come home and she'd cry, and she'd be like, oh my, why am I doing this work experience? But she kept doing it, because she was passionate about the fashion industry. Fast forward eight years later, my wife's now, you know, one of the, you know, whatever she's doing is incredible, like Inshallah. in the UK. And um, they, with that same publication, that same creative editorial head, Messaged her <laughs> and said, we want to cover you in a full page. So now they did a massive spread on her. A huge spread on her, the whole thing and everything. And the same person is like, oh, we're here with the most incredible person. <laughs> you know, the, and I'm like, yo, you don't understand. Did the head know? Did the head know that she the had... The thing is, I have met, I met the head once at a random event. And um, she was like, you know, oh, yeah. I was like, you know, my sister, the work experience. Went, oh, yeah, she was lovely. This I was like, I'm all right. I don't think you and know. Then, <laughs> I didn't say my wife. I didn't even go to the shoot. I was like, you know what? I'm not going. But it's just so ironic how now it's like you're controlling the media. So now they yeah. want you because you make them look good. Yeah. So then when it came down to it, and now we had brands that were just trying to build partnerships with us. So I'm like, hold on. So now 
when my wife started a platform, both of us started me about three years ago, yeah. and it was through a place where we were both going through like depression and a hard time. And you know, through our friendship, well, let's use social media as a way to like get a message out and yeah. start, you know, encouraging positivity. So she did that through the female angle with beauty, and mm-hmm. I did it in my angle. And then at the beginning, bro, we would message people and brands to work with, even just to even get space to work at. And you know, they would wouldn't message back or anything. And when we all this started happening, these same brands were wanting to do like partnerships and deals. And when they started coming to, pay, to, the, to the table, there were then these middle agencies that used to get involved and be like, you know what? No, we'll help facilitate this. Or we want 20% of this. And, you know, we've got this opportunity for you. I'm like, hold on a second. We would, if you check your message, we were trying to hit you up three years ago anyway. There you go. So now you're coming in with all these extra commissions and stuff. So now I set up this company. I was like, you know what? To hell with Cut that. The man out. I'm gonna be the middle guy. There you go. So I set this up. So now we have our own production team, we have our own studio, we have our own management, we do everything internally. So when she's got a shoot to do, it happens with yeah. us, with my guys who I trust. She sits there, edits the content while my daughter is in my arms at my office. Bro, how beautiful can you get? Perfect. And then on top of that, my brother, this look at this podcast, we own this equipment. There you we go. invested in it. We have our own studio. So this is what's so important to us is because- And what are you, number two now or it, something? Well, I'm like, number two in the, the charts. Yeah, yeah, so worldwide. <laughs> it was incredible. Bro. I was like, bro, I listened to people like Tim Ferriss and Guy Raz, all these guys and like, you know, just like, even just like competing with those type of guys was incredible. So bro, but our point is, is that this entire thing came from that passion of like, there you go. listen, if you're not going to give us a space or you want to eat off this 20% and this, that, the other, which is unnecessary, listen, either help us and guide us for the long term, but don't try and just be sharks and eat like, and bite our hands. So we're going to do it ourselves anyway. And now look, bro, now again, now they have no choice because there is no middleman. You have to speak to us. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So now what? Now we have to have the conversation and now we're going to demand what we want and we're going to demand go. how we work. But also that mindset, bro, now we can, we can encourage for other people. So when I'm speaking about these other 17 year olds that want to come into the game now and do things, my wife can be that voice for them and be like, you know what, girls? maybe I'll do a workshop with you. And you know, you can ask me questions like, you know, how do you set up your company? You know, how do you get an accountant? How do you do this? How do you do that? Because those are important things. And b- b- we had a major problem like, six months ago, we had this situation with the Advertising Standards Agency in the UK. They're cracking down hard right now on um, compliance. Yep. If, you do a, if you do a deal with a, with a company, uh, you have to say hashtag ad, right? Yep. So at the time my wife did a, a campaign with a company, she didn't know yet. She's not educated on it. No one told her and you know, give her the benefit of doubt. She didn't know. Advertising Standards Agency sent a letter, all these formal things. And obviously we were lucky that we managed her stuff. So we were able to deal with it. And we were like, okay, cool, we fixed it. They were like, fine, you fixed it. We won't take any action. Bro, three weeks ago, there was a, a, world, like a national news article that went out on BBC, The Mirror, on BBC News, on TV, everything. And it showcased her as like a prime <laughs> example, name and shamed. Oh no. D- Shape Beauty, when I did this, you know, she wasn't compliant with this, that, the other. But, but just to try and name and shame. And I was like, it made us so angry because we were like, hold on, we're willing to work with it, you. Yeah. Like you come and said, you know what, you need to be compliant. We want to be law-abiding citizens. So we're like, you know what, we'll be compliant. But yet you're going to push us away. So now in fact, Bro, I want to create my own st- advertising status agency. <laughs> I'm out here. So I'm meeting one of the directors next month because I'm like, yo, I'm sitting down with you because I want to know what goes through your mind. Because how do you think you're helping the situation? You're just trying to get promo for yourself. But these people that you want to be compliant, you're pushing them away and they want to help. Why aren't you sitting with us? Why aren't you creating boards where we can be involved? Yep. Why don't you understand that we are the future and that you are not the, you can't be these 50, 60 year old egotistic people that are now angry that young people are coming along and creating a platform for themselves. Integrate with us, bro. You know what I mean? And this is a massive problem right now because we're like, and we're sitting here because yes, we know the platform we have. We're aware of it. We know it's only going to grow inshallah, inshallah. but we want to be humble. We want to be progressive and we want to be able to encourage people to do great things. But when we sit in these mentorship things and someone says to me, how do I advertise? I'm sorry, but I'm not going to tell them about your compliance, dude. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> you haven't educated me, so I'm not going to educate them and I have no interest in doing that. We're going to figure out our own way of doing it. You know what I mean? Because bro, look, Netflix took out Blockbuster. You know what I mean? There you go. They didn't see it coming. So if I could do something to take out these agents, bro, that's how I feel though. Because I'm like, I'm not about that when I read tape and that. Dude, dude the, the, the game's completely changing. Yeah. Man. I mean, and, 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 and unfortunately, it's changing in ways that, you know, the, the, the people who are comfortable just don't understand or don't right. want to understand because it affects their bottom line. Correct. Like, look at all these, uh, imagine all these TV channels now, man. They'd be like, how come we're not getting the same sort of advertising that we used to? <laughs> because one, no one's watching. <laughs> two, everyone's on, everyone's following all these Instagram and, uh, you know, people on Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that. So, 
and, and, and it's, it's just a shift of power but the, but initially uh, even if you think about even in UK look at, you, you've heard of, heard of Max Clifford you know what I mean like a huge PR like guy in the UK yeah, yeah. now he's been done on various things that he's done in his career which are very bad but there's these people were like the top so for instance like when you had like Spice Girls and all these people yeah, that were like yeah, celebrities yeah. <laughs> they'll be the guys doing a PR but over that thing, they got the power, made them have ego, made them get into bad things, yeah. this whole Weinstein situation and everything. Yeah, yeah. And now it's like, you know what? If funny enough, the leaders of today, in fact, like in terms of the people with social influence, are regular human beings. Yeah. They're regular people who have power, but have humility, have power, but have a way to communicate with real people. Yep. And like what that can do in the future is mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, like sometimes I don't. I, like I really have to check myself, man. Like when 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 Sanama is out, my wife and gets like a hug from someone and stuff like that. Right. Dude, it's a real human connection, man. Yes. Like it's just like you know. Whereas like you had like before traditional celebrities, it'd be like bodyguards, it'd be like people standing like you know red tape and all that. <laughs> stuff. No, it's just like man, you just come and chill with us at Starbucks, man. Let's have a coffee and talk about life. But, and but, do you know what I think that's cool. I'll tell you what it is. I this is my take on it. So in, imagine you're a celebrity. You're you're a celebrity, but let's say you're you're famous, but you want everyone to know you're famous, right? So therefore you have this whole, because think about it, if you're a Spice Girl, maybe you can walk, th walk through a shopping mall, yeah? But if people see you walk through a shopping mall, they'll be like, oh, you're not as big as I thought you were. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because there's things that they can't, they can't see the numbers. They can't see your record sales, yep. X, Y, and Z. They can see the chart numbers, but it doesn't mean anything. But when they see you with this whole entourage and a paps and a madness, well, people call paps on themselves. So when they see this yep. stuff, it causes that like social, like <laughs> that cultural thing, which is like, oh my gosh. <laughs> now, when you have Instagram, bro, it speaks for itself. Like, yeah. Your followers and engagement is there. Yeah. So it's like, yo, you can come on there. I don't need to tell you I'm popping if I'm popping. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just doing my thing and you can see. So in public, it's actually nice for you to see that I'm just here. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just here like, yeah, cool, whatever. Like if it gets to a point where people are trying to, then for my family safety, maybe we need someone. But we Beyonce right Jay Z right now you right, know what I mean right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but, but for me man I mean I mean the, the best thing was I don't know if you saw that on on the video where this guy actually is just a normal dude yeah he just yeah. dresses up in, in <laughs> Times Square yes, and he yes, gets yes, some yes. paparazzi some bodyguards and by the end of the day people are all over him Times Square was packed mm -hmm. and pe like someone with a microphone would go but like so so what do you think he's like oh it's great to see the guy from Spider-Man here <laughs> and then someone else would be like yeah that's that's a, that's that rapper guy <laughs> no one knew but just the fact that he had this entourage that you said dude Times Square was packed it's FOMO fear of missing out fear of missing out people are like, yo we yeah we need to know who that is because of bro it's crazy I, I, I want to touch on a topic as well that I've got here as well which is I have this idea which is called positioning, right? This is ideology that you have to set yourself up in a way ahead of things to be put in the best position to be able to, uh, you know, achieve those things. Yeah. So for instance, let's say, and I think it's very important, like uh, touching again on people who want to be, you know, young leaders or do great things, you know, in the future, that I think it's important to think two, three, four, five years in advance, not to a level where you have to have like crazy business plans and this, that, the other, but you know, at least know that, okay, I have to set myself up in a way for the long term. So to, like, not take short term cuts to be able to just make the check now, but position myself with the right people, are in the right environments, with the right education, just in my brain, because no one can take this from you. You know what I mean? Yep. Like uh, your mind can't be taken from you. It's an asset you carry with you no matter what. Yep. So that should be the one thing, aside from your soul as well, that you, that you actually feed all the time. How much of your life has been you positioning yourself in the right places ahead of time and uh, uh, and that Stanford thing is a prime example of that but what other scenarios have happened where you've been like you know what I need to set myself up because I need that well sure uh, 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 the big thing with youth uh, and, and what I remember from high school and it's still done today is is when they say stuff like you are the leaders of the future but not today yeah just you just need to sit there and wait until someone tells you yeah you know? <laughs> I mean and that's, that's you're just, on yeah, yeah, yeah okay <laughs> alright now you're a leader <laughs> Or, or the leaders of tomorrow. Right. Or you're the creators of tomorrow. Right, right. Or the stars of tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you go home from that and subconsciously you think, oh, they said I'm going to be a star tomorrow. So I should, look, I'm not going to work today because I'll work tomorrow. It's like second place trophies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when you put that, don't say that to people. All right? Because everyone, given the information that's available today and all these things, resources that you have, you can do everything you want to some extent today. Right. You can go home um, and let's keep, let's stay in the fields of creators. 
You can go home and be a creator today. Today. Right, right. You right. have an iPhone, you're doing your sounding there. You have a little microphone, you can start your podcast. Right, right. Dude, Chance the Rapper won, Such what was example. it, two Grammys? Three. Three Grammys on SoundCloud. SoundCloud mm -hmm. that anyone can access and upload their stuff. Insane. So, so. And no I label. Sorry? No label. No label. Yeah. So people say, I need to wait for that opportunity. I need to wait for that company. Go and create. Go and be, become Bro, who the, you want to be. The opportunities you have today are what you'd have dreamed about a year ago. Easy. You know what I mean? So you're never going to be happy because you're always going to wait for that next thing that you think, exactly. oh, I need that. Or it's wait for someone to give you permission. Right. A lot, a lot of the thing with us as, 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 as us teenagers and young adults is we wait for permission because that's the way the world that we were built on. You work in a company where you wait for your boss to tell you you're ready for a promotion that you're ready for a promotion. Mm -hmm. Even if you've been doing the work for the person above you at that same level as your manager for like three years, now you're ready. Right, right. Look, I've been ready for the last three years. Wow, it's true, <laughs> you're it's true. You're waiting for that paper. All right, so I think, I think the thing we need to get out of us is that for me, and I, uh, one of the pivotal points is in journalism, I didn't wait for someone to get a job at a paper or for someone to say, send me your writing, I think you're a good writer. Or something. I just wrote an article. I just sat and decided I want to write. I'm going to write, and I started writing. All right. This is not to say don't go on. Like, okay, I want to start a podcast. Okay, who's got a podcast? I'm got a podcast. I'm Here's a podcast I recorded. Hey man, can you take a listen to it? Just maybe the first five ten minutes. Are you bored? What do you think? Any feedback? Something you know? Don't see feedback. Right. But it do, just like for example, if Amar, you came back to me and said, Yo, Khad, I don't think you're ready. That doesn't mean that I say, Okay, I'm not ready. It's just that's one feedback point. It's, I think, that ability to stop waiting for permission, to experiment, to go out and try things, to stop waiting for the right setting. For me to start a podcast, I need this, 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 and then I'll be able to do it. Right. No, just try small, take baby steps. We, don't, we, we, we have that issue with us taking baby steps towards the th places that we want to go to say that, okay, I want to be a podcast, podcaster, what do they call them? Uh, I think it's a podcaster. podcaster? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be a podcaster. Let me, let me just start something small. Okay, I don't need to have my cameras here and record it all. I can just start with a little 10-minute podcast, send it out to my friends and family, see what they think, take that feedback, build, grow, grow, yes, grow, grow. Yes, yes. Like, I think having that mentality to stop waiting for permission and just do, and, and I, I see some of his videos um, uh, I love Casey Neistat. Oh, I love, uh, love you know, and he's got this video, uh, video. He's got this tattoo that says do more work or something like that. Right, right, right. And that's it. Bro, it's, it's, it's acting fast, failing fast, and then learning fast. And growing. Right. He hasn't been to film school. Right, right. He says, that's what he preaches all the time. He had a HBO documentary off his own back. And there you go. Just by practicing. Me, the videos that I do, the editing that I do, I taught it myself. Mm-hmm. I have a story in my head. I get all the shots I want. I go, if there's some sort of new move that I wanted to do, like I remember for the first time that I did the whole, you know where someone says in the video, let's rewind. And then it takes a whole video and rewinds it in like five seconds with the music. I was like, I want to do that sequence in my video. I just YouTubed how to do rewind sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Final Cut Pro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and you figured you it out. You have every resource Bro, available. This, this, this podcast is the first time I've ever set up this equipment in my life. There you go. I used to have a, a, a little music studio in my house when I was younger. But aside from that, I haven't set this stuff up be like before. <laughs> so literally, my brother last night at 3 a.m., which was probably like 11 p.m. UK time. Yeah, I saw that in your Insta yeah, story. Yeah, sending, sending me a checklist. He goes, number one, number two, number three. Plug this in. Make sure you use these ports because these ports don't work so well. When you go in, and before I started, you saw, he said, send me a screenshot. Let me check it. And he's younger than me, and I'm learning from him. And, he, and on top of that, I was like, yeah, at 3 a.m., I was sitting there on the bed in the hotel, wiring everything, testing it, make sure the mics work. But all those things is because, bro, like we don't have, we don't have like the audio producers. Even the guys who help us produce a podcast back at the office, bro, they're not trained in audio podcasting, but they know how to pro podcast. There you up. go. YouTube videos, bro. That's it. Like, there's no excuse ever. You know, it's just, it's just, dude. I remember, like, just about a month ago, I shot a TV commercial, and there were eight men in my house. Eight men for a ten seconds video. Think about that. Think about how things are changing. Like I was sitting there looking at them and I was like, you know, bless them for their work. But I was thinking I could have done that on my iPhone. Right, 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 right. For, for, for things are changing. And, and, and the thing that I would advise 
you know, youth out there is don't wait for permission from anyone. Go out, learn about it, and do the work. I would want, like, do the damn work. Just you work. Have you have to, if man. you work, you will get there. If you work harder, you will get there faster. If you work the hardest, you'll be number one, inshallah. Bro, inshallah, man. And the best thing about being young is that you have the permission to make mistakes. Yeah. Your naivety actually counts. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I remember when I was 18 and I used to like go and do a couple of like, build websites and apps and stuff. And I used to go to meetings and like the people I would with would make a point of saying, yeah, he's 18. So as soon as I said that, I'd get a permission to be a bit naive and ignorant. <laughs> so I'd make a mistake. I'd be like, oh, you know what? Did it? And you didn't just be mad if I missed an email or something. But that also taught me that, you know what? Nah, I've got to be, I want to be 18, but I want to act like I'm 25. There you know you what go. I mean? Now I'm 25, I want to act like I'm 35. Like in a professional manner as well. And even now what we do work-wise, like, even, for instance, we started this agency last year and we were like, okay, we're going to be, you know, uh, we're going to create content for brands. We're going to help strategize, market and everything. A year in, you know, we've had, you know, maybe like 15, 16 employees come in and out. Alhamdulillah, now we've refined the team down to maybe six people that I yep. think are the most, you know, elite people I need in the team and the most efficient. Now, that's been in one year. Now, I could have had this idea for a year just sitting there, but I practiced it. I went through it. I was like, you know what? This works. It doesn't work. And even now, I'm still making mistakes and figuring it out. But right now, we're like, okay, we're taking a whole different pivot in the business. We're like, yep. you know what? We, people love the social content we create, yep. you know, for people's brands' feeds. Now, the problem is hiring photographers is expensive. Knowing how to create content is expensive, yet we have economies of scale through what we do. Yep. So maybe I could come in at a lower price point for brands and just offer them content services. Yep. And it's a huge curiosity in my mind now because I'm like, you know what? This could work. So now I'm building a platform to do that. Now, it might not work, but the fact that I can sit in my hotel in Dubai like I am right now, and when my wife's sleeping, I'm on my laptop coding, and I'm like, just because I want to go back and I want to test it. Yeah. We had a, and just even before this, we were in London, and my team said to me, Omar, we finished all the content we need to create now. What do we do? Sent them to Sainsbury's, uh, uh, you know, on the uh, retail stores there, yeah. supermarkets. I said, go down the food and drinks aisle, pick up every single product, go on the back of them, look at their Instagram and write it down, and DM them and see who gets back to us. And then what we did is we created this landing page template which said, well, I, uh, we, we said, okay, we love all these brands and now these brands, they haven't even asked us to create content for them. We went Selfridges, we went Sainsbury, all these different places and we bought their products, we paid mm. for it themselves. We came to our studio and we created the content. We then had this web page on it. It said, hey, Jamie, we love your brand. You know, we really love for you to blah, blah. We found out their email and sent it to them. And when they went on the page, it was colored in their brand's colors. It had six images that we created for free. And we said, just use it. We didn't even know if they're going to reply to the email. Mm. But I said, listen, we need to get 100 of these out and we might get one. But that work ethic is what the team then put in. And then even doing that, you have to bet on things that might not work. I'm obsessed with the idea that if something has a 0.1% chance of success, that drives me so much more than something that's proven to work. Because yeah. I'm like, this is, first of all, not a lot of people are trying to get, and secondly, there's a chance it could be successful. So why not make it a mission? There you go. You know? Do you, do you have things like that, like, that you're working on that you think are like, these are like small little passions that, are, that you really want to try and penetrate and make work? Do you See, have those? F for me, man, uh, like, and I say this in all honesty, I'm living a life now at 33 that I should have been living when I was 20. Okay. So questions, and that's why I admire you for your, like your ability to create that stability and build the company and stuff. Right. Like for me, I've only been doing this for like a year and a half, two years. I'm still just rediscovering myself. You know, so, you know, having that, those questions asked of me, like, where do you see yourself in five years or... You know, what are you building? What's your strategy? Man, I don't really know right now. You're just trying to be all around I'm just everything. Trying, yeah. I, so, like, I'm a freelancer. So, I kind of do things. Like, I try and create opportunities. But I also am reactive to a lot of the opportunities that come my way. And I've got an agent that sort of take care of, like, a, a great agency, uh, Bukhash Brothers. The name plug right there. Beautiful. Uh, they take care of me really well. Give me a lot of good opportunities to sort of be the creative that I am. And the issue that I have is, I, it's weird. I did an MBA. But I'm I'm a I'm a creative. Really? Uh, yeah. I'm, I mean, I didn't, but I'm just a creative man. I suck at business. I mean, I'm really not that good. <laughs> like, I'm not a good negotiator. I mean, and I know it's good that I know these weaknesses because I get people involved. I mean, I can think about a business. I can help build it. But, but you played your strengths, though. I played in my strengths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for me, I'm just free right now, man. Like, I'm j I'm just living this life where I create stories, where I work with brands, and you know. Maybe in a couple of years after doing this work, I'll be like, okay, maybe I want to be at Umar's level where I say, okay, let's, let's <laughs> no way, in terms of building a company or something. Right. But, but 
right now I'm probably something that I haven't been throughout my whole professional career, and that's happy. Wow. I'm just I'm just happy. Bro, happiness is so underrated. It is because man. you know what the crazy thing is, people think. I just again going deep. Sorry, I go into these deep thoughts, but this my it, my brain just thinks too much. Do it. Um, you don't have this bad habit, yeah. When I'm in, when I'm in, when I go to visit new places, not only do I visit them, but I Google what they were like before they were that. It sounds crazy. So for instance, like, we're staying in the marina in Dubai. Yeah, I'm sitting there and I'm looking over the balcony. And I'm like, what did the marina used to look like five years ago? And I'm googling and I'm reading Wikipedia articles because I'm obsessed with how things were before someone thought of doing it. <laughs> anyway, it's really weird. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> this idea right now, we come to the happiness thing, is that people have this um, this idea of you know uh, the weight of happiness and and a good life. So they think, okay, if I go to university, I get a degree, I get educated, blah, 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 blah. I will then get a job. And because of the work I've done here, this job is of value to me because I've worked for it. Yep. But that job comes with a price tag, which is um, normally capped at a certain rate. Yep. Yeah, like you're going to get this salary or you can get promoted to this degree. And people then chasing that promotion. And you get a promotion, but you value that promotion. So now let's say, I var- yep. let's say that promotion is giving you 100 grand a year. You're valuing that 100 grand so much because you know what's gone into it. But you have now the, the, the idea of a leap is so big to you because you're like, oh man, like, but doing this, you can make 200. But that can be done so easily and with stress free. Yeah. But it's underrated. You know what I mean? So people are valuing the money they make, first of all, aligning that to happiness, but also valuing it based on what it's taken to get there yeah. rather than the fact that nowadays, with the access you have to technology and everything, you can do so much more. Like by having by having a passion for putting your own content out, you can get advertising. Advertising can support your family. You know what I mean? You can yeah. put out YouTube content. That advertising can support your family. You could do other things at like Instagram. You could do partnerships with brands. With that, you can earn yourself a nice 80, 90, 100 grand salary just of doing content. You know what I mean? And it's possible. This is real stuff that people in their 20s are living right now. And it's stress free, bro. Dude, I think uh, I think it's the whole conundrum. Is 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 we came from a our parents came from a generation where success equals happiness. Right. Where I think now with 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 our generation, it's like happiness. Finally, we're flipping the formula where happiness equals success. And for me, you know, when it comes to to being successful at something, I've sort of boiled it down to one strong definition for my life, and that I I like to share with people is I believe. I don't know what happiness or success will look like to you, but I know what failure will. And failure doesn't necessarily mean not making money and stuff, just failure overall, because that's what failure means for me, is taking the talents that Allah has blessed you with and suppressing them because you want to be seen as something successful or good in this world. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an actor. Jim Carrey and Robin Williams were like my heroes, right? So like you had Jim Carrey on Ace Ventura, or the classic, and, and Robin Williams and Mrs. Doubtfire. I just loved how they could make me happy just by watching them no matter how bad a day I had at school. So to me, that was they were the most powerful guys in the world yes. because they could change how I see things. To me, they were successful, whereas to my parents, an accountant was successful. Yes. Uh, 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 a doctor was successful. Uh, and uh, success equals stability, not right, happiness. Right, 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 right. So parents right. want you to be stable. They don't necessarily, because when I talk to a lot of parents, I'm like, so what do you want your kids to be? And they're like, doctors, blah, blah, blah. Why? Because yeah, that'll give them a good, stable life. I'm like, do you think it'll make them happy that they sort of... That's such an interesting way of like, looking at things, yeah. For, 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 for me, I always knew where my talents lied. And I always knew that these talents made me happy. Happy. Just happy. Bro, how, how happy do you get just off the idea of like... Because I experienced it. It's just like having a creative idea and just seeing it come into fruition. Oh you know what I mean? When I hit that, like, like uh, my wife and I do like these Facebook videos and stuff. When I hit that publish button on Facebook or and then I take a clip of it and put it on Instagram or... Create a little I'm meme video. I've seen the ones where you have the text up below. And I'm like, at one point you have to figure out, I only recently learned how to do captions on videos as well. Like yeah, you know, you know, like yeah, subtitles. yeah, yeah. I used to do the old school way. We used to literally import the text every time. Yeah, yeah. And I figured out a subtitle way of doing it. I was like, "Whoa, this is cool." I, I just, yeah. I just feel blessed. I just feel yeah. so, so absolutely happy. And I think one of the biggest things, and and I think I can't remember if it was Casey. I think it was Casey Neistat that talked about it, where he said, "The ability uh, to live your life by your own rules and make money doing the things that you want to do." I think that's one of the greatest sources of, of happiness and freedom in this world. Really is. And, and just to be able to live that life right now, uh, call me a freelancer, call me an entrepreneur, call me a bum if you want. But 
You take I can, that. Yeah. I'll take that of for course. the life that I am able to li- live 100%. and to be able to live that life. And this is, the, this is the kicker here as a father and a husband is to be able to live that life and provide a good life for my family. Right. Now, right, I don't right. know if I'm going to be able to afford yachts and skyscrapers and sort of, you know, be in the islands with P. Diddy and stuff like that. But I wake up every morning with this sense of gratitude and blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to live this life to be able to create the life that I want every single day and not have to answer to anyone, not have to have anyone say, hey, you know, we start work at 8.30 and it's 8.34. So just make sure you're in on time to already be pooped on, you know, at the very <laughs> so first crazy. point in yeah, the yeah, morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. To me, that's, that's yeah. just an absolute blessing. And, I'll, and again, I say this, Umar, and it's very important that the, the, the youth understand that, is I've seen, and I said this at the beginning of the podcast, I've seen what the other side looks like. I've seen what it look, gets looked the like. Harsh lessons, the man. harsh lessons that you've learned, you know, at sea in an office till 11 p.m. just because you need to be there for something that's not that important. To be away from your family for something that you know is mediocre, but you're just putting in the FaceTime because you want that promotion at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. To keep, funnily enough, to keep doing work that you just... Makes you, bro, <laughs> hurts you. Look, look, bro, it's so crazy because look when a recession hit, there's people, in fact, people uh, related to me that had been at, let's say, a bank for 30 years. Recession hit. They now become made redundant. Their bank doesn't care about they you, don't bro. Care, they man. don't care. Now you've left and you can't get a job anywhere because that's where you've been for 30 years. You only know their system. That's it. Their process. You don't know anything else. So what have you done that entire time? Now you're regretting it. But a month ago when you had a check, you were all right. But you're living, you know, a means to an end every, every time. Someone also told me this interesting thing as well, which is about your parents as well, as you were touching on that, is that as much as you respect your parents, and you always should, your parents can only, for instance, tell you where to get to in life based on what they've achieved. So imagine your parents have got up to here. They can only tell you what's here and below because that's all they know, bro. You know what I mean? But when you're looking at people, like let's say you're Richard Branson's, your Rocks and Casey Neistat's, they might have achieved up to here on a creative level, business level that you want to achieve. Now, there's a gray space here that your parents might not know. But because of the respect we have for our parents sometimes, we lose the fact that this isn't everything, you know what I mean? And we, and we, and we think that, okay, you know what, I've taken them for every single word they say because they must know best because of my parents. But with all due respect, there is a, a, a gray area or, or something above that that we also have to aspire to. Yeah. And I think it's important to know that so that we can't, because I get messages of people that say, oh, my parents want me to do this. Yeah. They'll be happy to do this. I'm like, yeah, but I understand that. But what have they achieved with the greatest respect to, to <laughs> give you that information? You know what I mean? Like, it's just very important to have that in context, you know, because, bro, the crazy thing is this shift comes in life and I'm going through that right now where I'm in my mid-twenties and now my father asks me for help on his business. Yeah. My mom, I'm, I, I help support my mom. You know what I mean? And I'm like, they used to provide for me based on the way they live their life. Now they get into a stage where it would be nice for them to take it easy, you know? So I'm like, well, that's it. they gave me the freedom to do what I wanted to do hence why I can do that for them yeah. but what if I was just doing something that they wanted me to do as a job and now they're on my case saying oh well you know we can't retire we can't do this or we can't go here and, and I'd be like well, you'd literally feel inside well you never gave me the freedom to be what I wanted to be and because it will pay dividends in the end so I think for parents it's important to understand like the way you are to support your children in anything they're doing and for children themselves to be like look I respect you I understand but I'm going to go down this way because I believe it will pay dividends eventually. See, see the, the thing with me is my, my belief on this is the parents might not understand what you want to do. If it's like, you know, you got kids now saying they want to be YouTubers when they grow up. Yeah. They want to be podcasters. It just sounds nuts. It just sounds <laughs> nuts, right? Parent or, or whatever they want to be, dancers, actors, because you only hear the story. I mean, when someone says they want to go and be an actor, what's the, th- you th- the thing a parent will think of? You're going to be broke. Right. Or right, an artist, right, right. you're going to be broke. Because... You know, we always hear the story of the, look at Brad Pitt. He was a chicken in a chicken suit or look at The <laughs> Rock. He was like on, 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 on like $7 in his yeah, pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone's poor in this place. No, again, it's not that stability. Parents will have a hard time understanding the creative thing that you want to do. What they do understand is work ethic. And that's why mm-hmm, I always mm-hmm, come mm-hmm. back to that. So parents, when they see you busting and getting out there and, and having this work ethic, it's just grinding every day. They understand that. And, and another thing is they understand the outcomes. They need to see something tangible. So for my dad, yeah, you're right, it was you're only right, when right. he saw me on CNN that he's like, oh, yeah, all right then. <laughs> now I get it. <laughs> At 31 years or 32 years old. Right. 
That's what he's like. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, so maybe he's onto something. Who was that actor? There was an actor, I can't remember who it was, that said, you know, even he's like the super successful actor at like 60. Like his dad's still like, what are you, are you still messing about with that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so the like multi-billionaire, you know, you know, so they won't get it. Like now if you say like in, in the Arab world, like I'm an entrepreneur mm-hmm. and it's like your dad comes be like, you mean you're unemployed, son? Yeah. You're not an entrepreneur, you're unemployed. So, so I just think just do the work because parents will understand the work, the work, yeah, and then show them your success. And, and, and even if it's in small increments, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Like, like even someone saying to me, you know, how do I get the permission to do like something that my parents don't want me to do? I'm like, you know what? Start off on small basis. Say to them, mom, dad, give me three months. Let me do this in three months. Yeah, yeah. And after three months, have a little KPI. That's you know, this is a key performance indicator that you yeah, say, yeah. you know what? I'm going to do. I'm going to achieve this. And then work towards that small goal. Yeah. But it's a goal that they'll appreciate that you work towards. Absolutely. Now, even if you have to cheat the system and make it easy for yourself, yeah, so that so it wins them, wins yourself the eligibility to do something bigger in the future. But at least get them on your side and show them you're working towards something. Absolutely. And Always. that can sometimes work. Because sometimes saying to your parents, I'm not going to university, I'm taking this massive step, is too much. But saying, you know what, give me the summer is better. Uh, rather than me working at your shop, dad, give me the summer to do my thing. The thing, the thing that I want to uh, just touch on as well, uh, because I know a lot of youth listen to your thing, uh, listen to your podcast. But okay, say they want you to be an accountant, and right. you've you've already invested three years into this accountancy, but you know in your heart that you like movies or right. you like sports, for example. Okay, go be an accountant at you know Liverpool club, football club, or go be an accountant at you know. You know, BBC or yeah, some yeah. entertainment. Merge it in somehow. Yeah, because maybe there you can be your accountant and then you're around this place that does the things that you love. Yes. So you can slowly start to meet the people in there, maybe volunteer a bit of your time on the weekends, do the, and then transition there. So some sort of happy medium that you kind of, yeah, at least, both, at yeah. least because at least you're in that environment, you can make the transition. There's so many ways you of can, doing there's it. There's so many ways of doing it. But, but like for me, I know a lot of people who at least in this part of the world say, look, I've already, I'm a, it's my first year working as an accountant. I did four years and now I'm stuck at this bank that I really want to be in the arts. I'm like, I mean, I'm sure like a museum needs an accountant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm yeah, sure yeah. like some art gallery needs an accountant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a pay cut, but that's the thing with people is they're like, yeah, but I work at the bank. And but the I make- education you get is a pay rise. There you go. And so, so like, and that's the problem. It's like someone will say, yeah, I got to Like I work at this bank and I get 10,000 like, or whatever, 10,000 dirhams, and I'm like, or $10,000, let's just keep it like sort of international here, $10,000, and you know, I, I don't like it, and I really want to do arts, I got an offer a couple months ago from this company that will only give me $7,000, I'm like, what the hell do you want, man? You know, what, what are you, 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 you think someone's just going to be like, here's a great offer for, uh, from an arts place that's exactly what you want, and here's the exact work you're doing. Here's a salary increase for you, because we know that's exactly what you want. <laughs> and by the way, on the weekends, you don't have to do, or, or half of the week, you don't have to do your accountant. You can just do the art stuff that you're passionate. What do you want, man? And with no experience. <laughs> you want something, you, no, they want things. You can't, you will never, there is never a perfect scenario. Right. There is never a perfect scenario never, yeah. for anything in life. Mm-hmm. There's right. never nothing is gonna be perfect as you want it. And again, with that's why I encourage a lot of youth to go do internships because even if someone does get the perfect job that you want, even if a, a young lady says, "I want to be a broadcast journalist," all right, and they you know get the they go to the interview, they get the job at BBC, all right, and then they go, it's the first day on the job. They've got all their stories that they want to cover. They get that and they they're ready. They've got their journalist sort of. They've seen their journalist. They've got their yeah, you know the yeah, journalist yeah, clothes yeah, on. Yeah, you know, yeah. or someone who wants to go out into the field. They've got their like you know the the head scarf yeah, around yeah, their everything. neck. You know, they're ready to go with the Timberland boots and you know, they're <laughs> ready to go. They're like, I am the journalist. And then they get in on their first day of work. And they're like, they go to their boss. Or I've got all these stories. I've got all these things that I'm I'm really passionate. I'm ready. And then the boss just looks, look, man. All you need to do right now is go downstairs, get one coffee, two sugars, and bring it right back to my office. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, it's just like what you envision. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and this is what you're, you're going to be doing some edit or some copy work for the next six months. So <laughs> some people just want to go to a shop and buy life in a box. Uh, exactly. You know what I mean? You're going <laughs> to be doing this for the next six months. You're not going to sniff. 
your own journalist. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, but tell me that coffee smells. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be making my coffee till you love it. <laughs> so, so, so the thing with this is, is, is then you need to think. Are you like, gonna be writing about coffee? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're gonna be a like coffee column. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But but you think. Like one, go and learn about this job, yeah. and maybe maybe you need to be independent. Right. Maybe right, you need right. to join Umar's company, and he gives you a chance to sort right. of cover stories and stuff like that. For, for I think the perfect scenario is never there, but you need to sort of make the most of whatever you have. Yes. You need to go and say, okay, I know in BBC, maybe I'll not get what I want, but if I can sniff a couple of journalism stories every month for six months, that'll be enough for me to sort of make a move maybe into a smaller place. Well, at least I can say that I went to the BBC. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, well, at, least, at least there's something that you can take from it. Like, you can overhear a conversation that might be valuable to you. There you go. Half the anecdotes that we were speaking about or the, the, the stories that we're touching on are things that we've just, you know, come across randomly at random times in our lives. Absolutely. And we're sharing those stories. These are very important things because you just go through them day to day and you're just like, all right, whatever, whatever. A prime example, like even um, uh, Osman, who's here as well. I met Osman for the first time today, by the way. They, uh, who's here, well, I'm producing you guys were brothers. No, so our, our wives, are, <laughs> our wives uh, know each other. And they, right. uh, we went for dinner with um, his wife and sister um, a few He's days ago. He's got love. You, and you brought him to Abu Dhabi? You just met him yesterday? Bro, That's his, some his, love, uh, bro, uh, bro, I put on my Instagram. I need someone to help me film this podcast. And then his wife DM'd me and said, my husband uh, would be happy to help. He messaged me, bro, and he literally said he'd bring me here. He, that's his camera there. Respect. Bro, and he brought his son yeah. with him. But a prime example is, if, for instance, just by being around him, he, look, he's bringing his son with him to work. No, no, you know what I mean? Like, he's a, he looks after his son all the time. But just investing his time, freelancing, doing all that kind of stuff, and have amazing contacts, mashallah. But bro, look at the quality of life. You know what I mean? Look at the happiness that I bring someone. To be in, the, your child's here, you can take him home. You're not rushing home to get your child, your child's here. Yeah. You know what I mean? So these things are like things to aspire to, but you know, to me, that's goals. You know Absolutely. what I mean? And like, even what you're doing now with the, with the freelancing and like, you know, finding time to like have your children everywhere with you and spending as much time as you can with them, bro. Like these are things like, inshallah, your children will listen to this in 10 inshallah, years time. Man. Now these type of conversations stay online forever. I know. You know what I mean? <laughs> as long as someone comes, it doesn't come and crush the internet. <laughs> but, uh, and we'll build our own internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we'll figure we'll it out. We'll put it on YouTube as well and everything. But bro, honestly, I just want to say, Thank you. Like I could, words can't express how grateful Thank I am you. that you've made this time man. for me, bro. Likewise, you know? of course, man. We're here for you. We're your family in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. So much. Anything you need from us, any of your, of your listeners ever come pass by, man, make sure they Thank you so much, come man. by my house, man, for some And tell them, where they, tell, tell them where they can find you, you know, where sure. they can discover you and what you're working on. So, so yeah. uh, we're on at Khaled Al Amri on Instagram and Facebook. Do you want to spell that real quick? So, uh, uh, so at K-H-A-L-I-D-A-L-A-M-E-R-I. And if you just type that name into Facebook, that's where we put a lot of our content. Um, a lot of our work now is with Facebook on the Facebook media program. So, uh, you know, Facebook is launching their Facebook watch. Oh, uh, yep. They're done in America so, right now, yeah. Yeah, it's, which went, it's gone live in America with some select, some mm -hmm. select um, uh, content creators. So they're launching out here, inshallah, early next year. And we're part of their media partnership program. Uh, we're doing a lot of content on Facebook, uh, you know, videos, sketches, stuff like that. Uh, Sanama's uh, my wife so Sanama Mohammed is also on Instagram at S-A-L-A-M-A M-O-H-A-M-E-D <laughs> uh, uh, she's got her jewelry line coming up she's going to do some cool. stuff in fashion um, again she does skits she's she's uh, she's so funny well, you, guys are characters, man. you guys have to you guys have to just go into their pages and just watch the videos they were literally so entertaining <laughs> so funny <laughs> I, I literally I'm just like uh, smiling ear to ear man it's so yeah. beautiful but, but a lot of the work that we do on videos is try and uh, break the taboos uh, in a, and break the stereotypes so we just did a video that did pretty well it's called I hated my wedding Oh, I was on a Facebook post. We hated it, yeah. That's a Facebook and post. It was on yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was on Instagram. Okay, so we try okay, and post watch the video. because watch we know it. there's audiences on both. So we did a video called We Hated Our Wedding. And it, it talks about, and, and you know, I mean, a lot in our culture, both our cultures, you know, but, you know, I'm, I was speaking about the Arab culture, but I know it's very similar in, in a lot of uh, cultures around us is how we spend a lot of money on weddings that are mm -hmm, not really mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. us. They're kind of like for other people. Yep. Uh, and we did it in a funny we speak way. We in the car on the way here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so like I remember I did like uh, uh, we said in the videos like we spent all this money on food we didn't eat in a party we didn't get even even get to dad's at for a celebration that we don't even remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we, we just so, sort of looked at it as like why can't we do weddings that are about us first 
I mean, if you think about a time that you should be selfish, you'd think it would be that day. <laughs> yeah, it's like you think, right? Of all the days. Of all the days. Like, when you have selfish. a baby, you're not like, let's have a. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's make sure that we give birth to the baby in front of all these people in this lavish place. <laughs> no, you think, let's spend all this money on food that they can eat while I'm in labor. Yeah. You, know, you don't think about it. And, and the wedding is, we just sat there, man. We didn't have fun at all. And we spent money on that. Right. So we did a video about that. And we try and do it in a funny and entertaining way, short. Um, and, and those are the ty- that's the type of content that I think, you know, that we're proud of, uh, that we think can make a difference. But look, we're here, we're in conversation. Alhamdulillah, bro, I've learned so much of you. Thank I don't you. know if you bro, I, I would love for my wife to meet your wife. I would love Likewise, for my daughter man. to meet your kids. Likewise, bro. Man. Exactly, bro. And you don't know how much that could encourage everyone to be better people, better Muslims, better humans, and inshallah, better leaders as well, man. Inshallah, man. It's bro. an honor having me, man. It was an honor to be on this on your podcast, man. Uh, so I much. felt nothing but love, man, when Bro. you came in. You lit up the room, mashallah. Uh, alaykum. And one thing, uh, I, I want to give a shout out to to your your followers, man, to your to your <laughs> your family on on Instagram and stuff because they represented you really well. They got love for you because you. I remember as soon I was getting my, my Instagram was getting lit up by comments and and DMs of people saying that you're trying. So you, yeah, and you take care of them, man. Oh, of Look course, out for I will, them, man. This is all for them, man. I hope this you know creates some change and helps people at least like provoke a thought. In you their are, head, so. you are, man. Bro, thanks so much, much man. Much love, brother, man. Bro,